Today I'm talking to Sarah Hidani, the captain of the Black Ferns Women's Seven side, who stood on the top of the podium in Tokyo after achieving the silver medal position in Rio five years before. We go deep into what this campaign was really like, and I loved catching up with Gossi, and I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. Kia ora, Sarah Hidani. Welcome to Cultivate Conversations, Olympic gold medalist, home from Tokyo. Great to have you here. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Hey, well, today's just an opportunity to reflect on Tokyo, hear about potentially what's next. Um, but it's great to see you in person. The last time I saw you with a black eye, getting your moon. Um, but where are you calling in from today? Um, yeah, hopefully I look a bit, little bit better than when I talked to you last. Um, but in Papua Moa now, not, not in MIQ, I think we were talking. Um, and yeah, excited to be home by the beach. Um, and yeah, just with my family. Beautiful. Now, can you believe that Tokyo was three months ago? It has flown by. Um, just, I think what's happened in, in between then, I'm like, yeah, that's been three months, but I'm like, wow, that was, it feels like a short time ago, but then sometimes it feels like a long time ago. Do you feel quite exhausted from the last five years? Um, not, I wouldn't say exhausted. I think um, because of we, so we obviously had goals and what we wanted to achieve and actually achieving those goals, like I actually feel satisfaction which is a really nice feeling. And so now it's kind of thinking like, what next? What do I want to do? Um, to be honest, probably feel a little bit lost, um, which is a really weird feeling for me. I always have something in mind or something to achieve, but now I am actually having time and forcing myself to sit back and think, what do I actually want to do now? It's a really big transition of whether you go to the next campaign or whatever you decide to do um, but the post Olympic blues is a real thing um, for many things for many people not things gosh um, but we'll get to potentially what's down the track some options I know you've got had some great um, exciting announcements in the last week but let's rewind uh, to you leaving New Zealand for the first time in what was a long time for you. You're used to traveling so often. What was it like when you got on, got to Auckland Airport, probably was a little bit different to normal international <laughs> departures, and you finally left New Zealand to go to Townsville for your pre-camp? Jeez, I'm actually getting goosebumps thinking about it. It was, uh, well, yeah, but um 18 months of no no travel um like you said we're used to traveling to a different country every month we're in and out um normally probably my husband's wondering where I am most of the time <laughs> but so this trip was a lot different but real like there was just a, a buzz about it it was we're going there to do a job and everyone was extremely focused so heading away I was so excited to be traveling with the girls just in the kit again um and then but then getting to Auckland airport it was like oh yeah the, there's definitely like a pandemic going on there's no one here um all the stores were shut normally we'd we have like our um standard we'll go to like a Japanese place for dinner just before we fly out that was shut normally we'd go probably do a shop at Adidas that was shut so it's just like a real eerie feeling but like we were going to um Townsville I think we were there for like uh, three days before we got to play again so the excitement of playing international teams um, just getting on a plane again was yeah I was pretty buzzing. And a day after you leave New Zealand you're officially named the female flag bearer for New Zealand Te Pau Hapai Wahine uh, as we call it alongside Hamish Bond. What was that like for you? Yeah that was pretty crazy to be honest um just a really special moment for me and my family and it was um like I, I was pretty excited to actually be told back in New Zealand because it meant I got to celebrate with my husband um my dad my sister and brother and the rest of my family so I was I was really grateful for that um and it just meant that I was leaving home like on a bit of a high um and obviously having to leave them for two months was pretty tough then so, yeah, going to Townsville and um, 
and to be able to celebrate that with my teammates was was exciting as well. And it meant that we were able to carry that joy for the next month or so before we headed over to Tokyo. So yeah, it was a very, very special moment and obviously a huge honour um, and probably one of the highlights of my career. Well, a well-deserved recognition for you. But let's talk about Townsville as a start. You, you go there with a squad, but then not everyone's getting on the plane to Tokyo. What's that feeling like in a team which is so tight-knit already that you know that people aren't going to make, make the final, um, be in the final selection, but they are such a huge part of the team in itself? It's really hard, like um, like regardless of if you're going to the Olympics or, or whatever, like if, if you're around in a group that you like genuinely care about people, when people miss out, like you feel that hurt. And even if you're not going for it personally, like you see how much it means to them when they miss out. So it's actually really tough and you don't want to, if your name, you don't want to celebrate too much because you don't want to seem to look like you're rubbing it in. But yeah, so the balance is, is pretty tough, but um, I think going to Townsville and being able to play allowed girls to get the the sense of playing international tournaments again. Um, to be honest, it was probably really hard for them, but it meant that they actually got some game time last kind of trials before the team was actually named. So um, Townsville was awesome, but like you said, like still extremely tough because girls' dreams were over at a point, and then some of them actually still got named to travel to Tokyo but not to play so there was yeah a few mixed emotions over those those few weeks that we were away and we went into a lockdown while we were there so it pretty much brought our uh, Olympic prep and like COVID bubble um, brought forward by a couple of weeks which was hard but then it made it probably a lot easier to transition when we went to Tokyo. And you do get on the plane to Tokyo you are in an advanced party obviously because you need to carry the flag <laughs> But well, history, there was a bit of a mishap in uh, actually getting to Tokyo. The flag had to be captured. <laughs> yeah, there was a point there where I thought that we would not make it to the opening ceremony and that I was um, not going to be able to carry the flag. So it was, um, oh, so we were supposed to arrive the day of the opening ceremony, but not till after the opening ceremony had finished. So um, the the New Zealand Olympic Committee had asked whether I would be able to go over early um, and the team were happy with it. It was it meant that I got obviously a little bit extra recovery, but they didn't really want me going by myself. So they asked whether we could get more um, seats on planes and obviously more people into the village a little bit earlier. 11 people were allowed to go, which meant, um, I think there was 11, maybe less. Um, so it meant the starting seven were in, a couple of management just to make sure we were safe. And we already had like done the big goodbye because obviously leaving other girls is a big thing in our team. Uh, get on the plane, everything sorted. We didn't even get on the plane, so we went to the airport in Townsville, sitting there, sitting there, said they were going to we were delayed, and that's obviously quite normal for flights. Delayed again, delayed again. Missed our flight from Brisbane to um, Sing oh, Singapore, I think we're flying through. And then it was like, okay, what are we going to do? No more flights out of Townsville. Um, and the next like available flight out, I don't know, was like the next the girls' flight anyway. So it became like this, not a nightmare for us, like cause we're just players, we're kind of just <laughs> chilling out. Um, a nightmare for our manager. She was up all night trying to figure out what the heck was going to go on. Um, so they ended up getting us to Brisbane, staying in a hotel, Porsche that, uh, I don't know how Porsche drew the short straw, but I think she was my roomie in Brisbane. Um, we had to get up early with our trainer, go get a COVID test because our 72 hour or 48 hour COVID test had run out. Um, so caught a taxi into Brisbane to a drive through COVID testing place, but we're not in a car. <laughs> So like a manager lady from the place had to come down to get us through to get us a test. We had to go back to Brisbane Airport. Um, I think we were allowed, there was like a couple of hour layover, so we ended up trying to have a sleep. Um, get over to the airport, me and Porsche check in. The rest of the girls had to actually wait for the rest of the team to arrive. They then had to go get COVID tests again. 
Um, so it was, a, it was a bit of a nightmare, actually. We, <laughs> me and Porsche finally get on a plane. Um, and they had sorted, like, it was amazing. Like, they had sorted us out pretty well. But we get to Tokyo and we don't have um, our bags. They were stuck in Singapore. <laughs> So all of our stuff, or well, my stuff for the opening ceremony that I had had on me was um, still in Singapore. And the girls were actually in Singapore at the time where our pl- bags were, but the bags missed the flight. So we actually didn't get our bags for like a couple of days. So it was actually the funniest thing. Like I laugh about it now because I'm like, anything that could have gone wrong in that time went wrong. Um, but we had a joke and a laugh about and we had this group about capturing the flag so it got captured and we got to walk it through the stadium oh what a great yeah <laughs> how many hours did you arrive in the village before the opening ceremony I think it ended up being like a, we had a good time, amount of time so it was about four or five hours so enough to have a shower put <laughs> clothes on that we had in our backpack which weren't a lot um lucky the olympic committee had extra stuff we could wear have some food and then we're out to the opening ceremony so your official opening ceremony attire that you wore (laughs) capture that you had as the flag bearer wasn't actually yours (laughs) it wasn't i don't i don't know whose ones i've stolen but i've still got it so (laughs) So I'm sorry about the person who I've stopped. I think lucky there was a limited amount of people that could go to the opening ceremony. That probably is what saved me from getting extra clothes. <laughs> they did something weird. Um, right, well, so you finish the opening ceremony and the rest of the girls and the team, the whole management, arrive. What's it feeling like when this is your second Olympics, you're coming in with this lofty goal of gold or nothing else, essentially. When the team is finally there and you're in Tokyo and you're going to your first training um, at the at the facilities, what's the feeling like in the team? Oh, I think it pretty much sums it up. Portia and I were on the bus home from the opening ceremony and we seen a um, message on our team Viber that the girls had arrived at the village. And we both felt gutted that we weren't there to welcome them. Like, that was our feeling. We were so excited to see them. I hadn't seen them in (laughs) 10 hours or something like that. Um, (laughs) But that's how you get, like, when you leave someone who you've been around, like, for a whole month every single day, and then you leave them for, I don't know, 12 hours, it was like, damn, I'm not there to welcome them into our room. Um, So when we got back from the opening ceremony, it was just crazy. And it was like 11.30 at night, so everyone was a bit hypo. Um, So I don't remember sleeping a lot that night, but it was just like a buzz of holy, we're at the Olympics. Some of us for the second time, a lot of the girls for the first time. So watching them go into the room, see their Olympic kit, um, see there's a phone on your bed, um, new headphones, like things like that. It was just even like a box of masks to us were like, oh my God, you get a whole box of masks to yourself. <laughs> Just little things. Um, and then, yeah, I think the next day, I think we actually got a couple of days off to kind of recover and recuperate, get into time zones and things like that. And then getting to a field was awesome. Just a bit of fresh air, not having to wear a mask. Um, and then being in Japan around the volunteers was, yeah, just absolutely amazing. They'd um, do anything for you. So going back five years, not four, when you think back to Rio and that final game, you know, 24-17 to Australia, how much did that motivate this group coming into Tokyo? I think without that experience of winning silver, um, we potentially have never been the team that we've become now that, like, it was probably hard for me to like to submit to it before, um, but now, like upon reflection, I'm like, that is the reason why we are so successful and are so close and put so much emphasis into our culture. So, like, I'm actually really grateful for that time. Um, even at the even though at the time I hated it, um, to be frank, um, but now I'm like, well, we are the team now because of that and. Um, yeah, and it's a lot nicer feeling than what it was five years ago, that's for sure. 
and I guess you talk about we a lot, but for you personally, um, what's the shift been like for you from in this campaign as opposed to the Rio campaign? Oh, I, I suppose I had to um, figure out myself as a leader, as a person, and um, and be confident and in, in enough in myself to be able to lead the best players in the world. That's that's really tough at times. So. I was. I'm being very fortunate that the leadership group has been absolutely amazing, um, and the relationship that the leaders have with the management. Um, and so for me, like being able to speak openly and honestly with the coaches who are, well, I say essentially my boss, um, that we can have a really good relationship where, when the girls come to me with something or a problem or or something that's um, in the scheduling, that I'm able to go and say that to the management, so change happens. And I've been lucky enough to have a good relationship with them where if I've said something, they might listen or, or or then if they don't, then I'm given a reason why so I can filter that back through the team and then everyone's all on the same page. So, um, yeah, the last five years have been, I think, really amazing. I think the personal growth that I've had um, has been really helpful for not just rugby but probably for my life um, and having being able to communicate better um, and probably have better relationships at home as well. So let's go into the games now. So you are on the eve of finally being able to play in the Olympics in Tokyo. A <laughs> whole lot of other stuff has got to <laughs> for this point. What do you have for your last meal before pill play starts? Um, what did I have? I probably had a ramen. Um, I probably had chicken on rice. Um, I'm a big eater, so I probably had some dumplings. Um, probably tried to sneak in a little bit of veggies in there, but for me, it was just about getting as much as in a, as I could because sometimes you struggle to eat on game days, and obviously we played for three days, so yeah, trying to get as much as in I could, um, but then trying to stick to what I was normally eating throughout the week as well because you can overindulge when like the food was amazing. Um, so. Yeah, just trying to get in a lot of carbs um, and, yeah, just what I'd normally been eating for the week. So you wake up on game day, you get through pool play. How do you sleep that first night after, you know, being able to actually judge against some of these international teams that you, you used to playing all the time, but you've been in the dark for 18 months. So what, what are you feeling like after day one? I'm excited. Um, obviously, we we knew we were playing Russia in the last pool game as well, and um, and I think that's probably where like my stubbornness of certain things come in is um, the girls are actually pretty hyped, and the atmosphere, like the energy in our apartment, was quite high from girls playing, debuting at the Olympics, and things like that. But um, I was really fortunate, so I had my own room, and I'm really like diligent with my preparation, so. Um, as soon as we got back from the the um, stadium, I st- went straight to dinner, came back, like did my half an hour stretching routine, and then it was like, all right, I'm going to bed. Can you make sure the noise is down? Like I'm the old girl, like make sure you're quiet, like <laughs> um, just because I knew that I needed to care. Like I needed three days of being on, and I didn't want to leave things to chance. So, um, so I like was back in my room had the door shut like um oh, and I knew yeah, <laughs> yeah like I, I know I know in myself I had heaps of energy but I was like if I don't go to sleep at my normal time and because we were up quite early the next day to try and get down to a stadium like I think it was like quarter to six or something and like I had a routine of going to do pre-calling in the morning um and you could only get in in certain times fit your breakfast in to try and get on the bus so um so I was like diligent with my timings like and then I knew I wasn't very tired so I had a um sleep meditation music with my noise cancelling headphones like everything was down to timings yep so I knew I had to get my nine and a half ten hours sleep um which I was normal before game day so yeah I'm the I'm the nana with the routine and yelling out if girls are noisy at night yeah, you're after my own heart you'll see <laughs> I actually saw, I remember seeing um, at one stage on Instagram during when you guys were in the village and it was the the young girls 
this is the old girls and the old girls are sitting around the table a <laughs> cup of tea playing their get cards and the young girls are on the TikToks doing their <laughs> grooves grooving away and I was just like well that just couldn't sum you your team <laughs> up um but also how you just mold together as one when the time's right yeah they're like everyone's allowed to do what they want to do and we're all completely different which is awesome and I think that's why our team clicks so well um I think at that that point the old girls are actually doing coloring in or something (laughs) Um, (laughs) sorry not cards (laughs) it would be cards or coloring in one or the other um but like that's why it works is because they do that and we do that and we give it give each other some slack about it but then it's like well that's what we want to do and then as soon as you're like on field um ready for game mode it's like we're all the same person again and but then the same kind of thing is like before games um girls are doing tiktoks girls are dancing like singing laughing um and some of us are trying to sing, trying to not dance. Um, <laughs> no one wants to see that. But <laughs> then, like, that's their preparation and this is our preparation and girls still listen to music while we're warming up and you know that that's normal, like it's cool because you know that they're getting ready to play and that this is that's how we, I suppose, handle our own pressure and stuff like that. So as captain, is there a point where you say, right, it's game time, or you, you click your fingers and all that sort of comes um, to a stop and you then go onto the field? Or is it just a an unconscious understanding of everyone of, like, right, it's time? Yeah, like, I suppose as a captain, I've had to get to know people's, um, like, their way of preparing for games, um, their routine, sorry. So, like, knowing girls really well and that side of stuff, Um, has been really important for me because what I do isn't what Gail Rodden does and what she does isn't what I do so I can't tell her what to do to get ready um, which is really cool so I've just tried to watch all the girls over the last five years of what their routine is and I'll just notice changes if they're probably doing what they don't normally do Um, but like Gail for example she's probably the complete opposite to me like she wears her headphones up to a certain point of the individual prep and then there'll be a time she takes it off, we all do our individual handshakes, and then it's like, that's the team coming together, there's like team warm-ups and things like that, Um, and then there's like a couple of songs in the changing rooms that girls will do and sing or do whatever they want to do in that time, Um, and then it's like the next team huddle, that's when we come back together again, but there's like fluctuations in the warm-up, because you can't be on the whole warm up or else you're gonna be fatigued for the game. So no, I'm I'm pretty easy with girls' preparation and routine and obviously it was became a fine art before we got to the Olympics and then the Olympics was just what we normally do. Business as usual, but on the big stage. Yeah, and it was important that we kept that. Like we're a fun team, so there's no point in going to the Olympics and trying to be serious. Some of us have well are, which is okay. But for the most part, like and probably summed up the final pre final and what how we played in the final was we were the most relaxed I'd felt in the whole tournament and probably a lot of the tournaments leading into the games, like um there was a lot of banging on the wall, a lot of stomping a lot of movement like it was just a complete vibe before the game which is exactly our team I'm sure most of the teams listen to our stuff and I'm like how are they like going to prepare for the game yeah because we just have a good time and the management are included in that I'm just wondering how France is feeling you know they're in the changing room next to you and they're like oh what you know what are these people doing next door um (laughs) they're having a joke sort of thing they're very serious and they and then they're totally blown away by your ability to switch oh. on when it counts I really think we piss teams off like <laughs> bef- I honestly do like before a warm-up we're like yelling stuff at each other like and it's funny like you're kind of taking the piss out of each other during warm-ups and you can see like the team's right there like this you're in a small field and you can see the like tension in them, and we're, I'm like yelling at Gail, like giving her shit about something. Um, and then we're all just kind of having a laugh and 
and and whatnot and you like you kind of look across and they're like real tense and their coaches doing all the talking none of the good none of their players saying anything and that's when you're like actually we're just being ourselves right now like this is us and we would we should should never change that yeah and is that the goal like is it is it to be yourselves um and then to be on the field yourself accept yourself and then bring yourself to the world yeah um I think like Bunce our coach has allowed us to be ourselves wherever we are and like he he's probably probably figured out the best formula when he's seen us play good and play bad and probably for the most part playing good meant that we were relaxed we were doing things that we normally do every day um and we're just showing the character of who we were like what we were born like and he's emphasized the fact that that's okay and that's normal and you should do that and so then like that's why girls are allowed to wear headphones and we're allowed to sing and dance and before games is he's like why would we stop this like most of these girls are good at it, yeah, so yeah. I would. Where well, would we change it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I had girls in the rhythm, uh, gosh, I mean, I think she should probably go for break dancing in Paris. For mistakes. <laughs> I know, right? Like, so these girls are just having a good time, and you can tell how relaxed they are, and then they play like they play in the games, like they're just free to do what they want to do. So you head into the quarterfinal you know now that it's knockout. Does the message change? And what's the nervous kind of in the team like? Before the quarter, um, the, the message doesn't change in the fact that it's win or lose. Like, we know it's win or lose. We probably talk about winning or losing before pool play anyway. Like, um, pool play is still quite tough because you still want to make, like, you want to qualify first to play eight and things like that um but it's like these like these are the moments where we can either carry on and do what we're normally doing or then or don't and then we're going to be the ones disappointed that's probably where the like the comms start coming in but um because the quarterfinal was on day two second of day two like we were just real pumped to be playing the end of the day um and we were playing Russia again so we would played them in the morning <laughs> So it was just like, come on, let's like, we knew we were good enough to beat them. Um, It was like rectifying mistakes that we'd done in the last pool game. Um, So just, yeah, real, real excitement. Um, But obviously I feel changed a little bit for that third game. Oh, sorry, the semi-final, which is the game, the heart attack game for everyone. (laughs) Yeah, well, it was actually, I'm not going to (laughs) lie. You know, when you but when you think of the Fijian men and and the incredible talent that we've been exposed to through sevens, through fifteens of the Fijian men and the flair of these incredible athletes, how wonderful for the Fijian women. I mean, not wonderful because you're they're against us, like but how awesome for these Fijian women to have their moment on the world stage. Oh, I'm I'm actually so stoked for them. Um, and yeah, the game probably was closer than what we wanted and, and things like that. But for them to win a medal for their country is like absolutely out of this world. And, and I, like I know talking to them, a lot of them had never, would never have experienced anything like that before. So them going home was like, oh, they're absolute superstars over there now, um, which is what they need for their game to grow and more investment and people to follow them like you get that and your team just keeps pushing forward and like more forward and for a team in Oceania rugby like that's what if they're winning like I feel that we're winning as well like the improvement and the building of players in the Oceania region is huge okay let's take it it, not that I want to go back to that game because it was really stressful um (laughs) (laughs) was it stressful for you (laughs) I don't I don't mean to sound arrogant but no it wasn't <laughs> I feel like I was probably the most calm out of everyone but I like I think um I, I don't know I just had this real like I was really confident 
and I know that people don't say that, but I like I look at our team and I'm like, we've got the best players in the world, like hands down. We've got the best team in the world. Like we can't lose this, and it wasn't like a fear of losing or or things like that. Like I'm like, we won't lose this. We've got players who can break game open from anywhere, as it's shown. Um, but I knew that we weren't necessarily all on the same page during parts of the game, which was probably more disappointing. Um, and a couple of mistakes allowed them back into the game. Probably a couple of, couple of decisions um, towards the end of the game allowed extra time. So it wasn't like I thought, oh my God, we might lose this. I'm like, why have we not won this already? Like, that's probably where my head was. Um, and then, so when we went into extra time, I was like, geez, like, it's up to us. Like, if we want to win, we can win this. But we need to change something. And there was definitely a moment in the game, um, and I've thought about this a lot. Like, so normally um, uh, the first five makes the call on the kickoffs about where we're kicking off because Tyler's obviously kicking. And I remember Tyler coming back and asking what the call was. And normally it's, and then it was said we're kicking to um, the left hand side, which is away from the forwards. And I, they said, is it all good? And normally they never ask me. I just, or I'm like, normally like, nah, kick it to the forwards because we want the ball. But I was like, yep, sweet. And then I was walking back and went to tell Stacey. And I looked at Stacey and thought, why are we not kicking to the best um, aerial person in the game at the moment? And I remember like having this debate in like 30 seconds in my head, like, should I say something? Because that's what you think. Or should I just like trust them and let them go for it? And it's not like I didn't trust them, but I just had this really gut feeling that I should change it. And I remember turning and saying, no, we're kicking to Stacey. And Fitzy looked at me like, why are we changing it? I'm like normally the one who makes call. And I was like, please just trust me. We're changing, kicking it to Stacey. So she then had to tell Tyler, Tyler was like, okay, like, why are we changing it? I was like, please just, just trust me. Kicks to Stacey, Stacey kicks the, like, flicks the ball back, we get the ball and then I don't know, whatever happens. But I was, and then I remember thinking after the game, man, I'm so glad I trusted my gut. Like, I think if it had, if I hadn't have trusted it, would, would have, would have the game changed? I don't know, but. I didn't want that to be on my conscience if it had gone the other way. So you're through to the Olympic final. You finally have the chance to do what you've come here to Tokyo to do. Were you nervous? Um, oh, probably the easiest game I've ever got up for, to be honest. I don't, I don't know. I think because I had had such good prep and I knew exactly what my body needs, like, I just go into like pre-game mode again. So, oh, actually post-game because I needed stitches. So that altered my prep a little bit. That's all right. Got back, like had a shower, um, did my colds. And then it was like, get some stitches in, um, tape it up just so it wouldn't bleed. And then it was like instantly like, I go into like this robot, I reckon, like if, like food, um, uh, get as much food into me as I can, come back, and then it was like lights off, we're all having a sleep, whether girls sleep or not, doesn't matter, it's like lie down, rest, and then wake up, watch the pre-game, I oh, watch the game from the uh, versus Fiji, pretty much didn't need to watch it, because you're like, yeah, we need to change most things for the final, um, watch all the games that France have played, for me, it's pulling out like set piece stuff, and then it's like talking to Stu, set piece leader. So, have you gone back to the village in between the games? Uh, no, we've actually stayed at the stadium. We talked about going back to the village, but because the it would have been potentially an hour back to the village, an hour back to the stadium, um, and there's no guarantees on traffic. The the stress alone would have just caused a bit of strife. And then by the time you get through security, get back to the your beds, I think we were ended up having like 40 to 45 minutes, which isn't really long enough to actually have ideal prep. And when we seen the changing rooms, they were actually quite big compared to what we probably normally get on the series. Um, like we'd gone down to like, we've got mattresses that we carry and use for in the changing room most of us took our blankets and pillows um and then you just take a massive ass bag full of all your stuff there was like an ice 
bath um, out the back of our changing room. So we pretty much packed for three days of living at the stadium. Kind of sounds like a good <laughs> testimony, actually. Um, <laughs> so the final whistle goes and you've completed your dream. You've completed your mis- mission. What are you thinking, Gossie? Um, geez, I'm getting a bit emotional. You're just saying that, but I'm just absolutely over the moon. Like, for I'm stoked because of what we'd achieved, but probably more so of how long it's taken us to achieve that goal. And like, and I know, and I knew that not many people in the world get to win a gold medal. So to do that, um with the players that we got to do it alongside like it's just an unbelievable feeling um and I know there were a lot of emotions and and things like that but I was just absolutely over the moon for what we had achieved as a team and probably more so what we'd achieved off the field than like then on it then on it as well And you go and you do this incredible interview with Ricky Swinnell which um I don't know if there was a dry eye in New Zealand, to be honest, um, even thinking about it now. And you touch on your mum and her tragic passing this year and, and how much it meant to your family that you were there. Do you feel like she was on your shoulder through this campaign um, in these ha- hard times willing you on? To be honest, I feel like she was behind me kicking him out the ass most of the time. <laughs> 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 Which is would be standard her, and then probably more so she's probably in the stadium having a beer watching all the games. So, like there's a um, video and photos of the girls, and we all like look up at the stadium, um, and then wave out. And for me, that was probably more like waving at her and just acknowledging that I knew she would have been there. Um, and I always laugh now. Like one of the girls asked me, "Are you gutted that your family can't come?" And I said, and selfishly, I wasn't at the time after my mum passed because it meant that if everyone was there and she wasn't, I probably would have got more upset and it would have been quite tough. But then I laughed and I was like, actually, she's probably done this on purpose and she'll be there without anyone else. So, um, yeah, it's, that, was, that was really tough. But I wanted to, I was so excited to talk to my family because I knew how excited and happy they would have been after the games and obviously being a really tough few months seeing my dad smile for the first time in like three months was like the best thing ever and you've been able since uh returning to New Zealand to share your medal with your family with your dad um with your sister and your brother and your niece and nephew what what's that been like to see the medal around their neck yeah that's been really like that's been probably the coolest thing is sharing it with my loved ones um, with my family and with like people who have helped get me to that point and um and I started actually taking videos of people when they were putting it on um but you get like the same questions like um well firstly it's like do you have your medal on you and if you say no then they're not very happy so you tend to take it everywhere and then they'll grab it and they're like holy it's heavy next question can I put it on I'm like yeah go hard next question can I take photos of it and I'm like I'll take photos of you and they're like yep sweet like they don't care about me they just want the medal but it's been cool seeing like I've here I have some like videos on my phone of people like getting the best photo with it and like just seeing how happy they are putting it on like that's what makes me happy as well is that you get to share something with people that they don't necessarily get to see or have never seen before um and it was cool like my niece I think more so because she was like oh auntie that's your gold medal but I don't think she really knows what it means my nephew was just stoked that he got to wear this big thing around his neck and could swing it as fast as he could um (laughs) which was really dangerous but when you see that then you're like yeah I'm just their auntie like they don't really care about me winning or whatever like they were happy that they got t-shirts and like gifts from me more than probably what the medal meant to them well, one day they'll look back <laughs> and realize the significance of their the significance of their auntie's achievements 
Now, I did hear a little bit of a yarn that you were at um, one of the Farah Palmer Cup games um, supporting Manawatu, uh, your home team and your sister's team, uh, and that the medal was being passed around the stand <laughs> while the game was on. Um, probably true. That I, um, I, so I'd obviously gone down to watch my sister play in the final, which was amazing that I was being uh, able to be down there but so I had it in my pocket but I didn't want to watch the game with it in my pocket and a lot of my family had come down to watch my sister and my cousin and her husband and three kids had come down from Napier and they hadn't seen the medal before so I was like well I'm not gonna have it in my pocket during this game so I just gave it to my um one of my nephews and he's like six and he watched all the games and he knew exactly what was going on and so he took it and then obviously I went and watched the game for the 80 minutes, came back and like probably 15 of my aunties and uncles and cousins and stuff were there. And so I had heard that it just got passed around and they say the stadium, but I'm like probably most of those people, my family. <laughs> um, and Cause I hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen them for a few months. So yeah, but I've been now it's probably got a few, dents and grooves and extra stuff on it but for me I'm like I told everyone as soon as I was getting home that I would share it with as many people as possible and that that was what was important to me I didn't want it just to be my medal I wanted it to be New Zealand's medal so yeah it's definitely seen a few people now well it just speaks volumes to the person that you are Gossie hey I'm conscious of time but I've done a quick fire five uh, for uh, all the Cultivate conversations that we're doing on this Tokyo wrap. So, best souvenir from Tokyo? Um, oh, the the Tokyo um, duvet, I think. The village duvet, yeah. And it was free? Yeah, yeah. And now I have the 2016 and 2021, so I was pretty stoked about it. Nice. Okay, best meal in the dining hall? Oh, can I say everything? Like, I actually gained three kgs before the tournament started, <laughs> which was awesome. Um, oh, no, I'll, I'll have to say dumplings. They're probably one of my favorites anyway, but traditional Japanese dumplings. Nice. Okay, best roommate? I know you were uh, in a solo room. but I was by myself and it was bloody amazing. Um <laughs> Well, this is actually going to be awkward because since mum's passed, I've only ever had two roommates um, just because of, yeah, obviously being very emotional at night. So it's either between Kels and Porsche. I can't really pick one of them. That's right. We'll say it's an equal tie. <laughs> okay. Um, your best meal on return to New Zealand? Oh, I can't go past the McDonald's I had. Um, an MIQ that I actually got sent from Fletch Vaughan and Megan, which was amazing. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, very grateful for that. Okay, and plans for the summer? Um, hang out with Connor and Booker and pretty much just be around as my family and friends as much as possible um, and have a few drinks on the beach. Sounds like a good time. Hey, just lastly, now you have signed with the Hurricanes for the inaugural season of Super Rugby Aotearoa for our Wahine, which is very exciting. How pumped are you about are you about this? Oh, I'm really excited. Um, as a kid, I followed the Hurricanes and obviously Christian Cullen and, and the like, and to be able to potentially wear that same jersey like that's there's a dream come true for me. I'm absolutely excited and I can't wait to, to get on board. And <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Bob? Oh, gossip. How Hello. are you? Are you good? Yes. Okay. I'll be one minute and I'm just hearing about Gossie's going to play for the Hurricanes. Are you going to cheer for the year. Hurricanes? Will yes, I bribe no? you with a free yeah. t shirt? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Max, go on to the just for one second. Thank 
you. Thank you. Bye, okay. Max. We can buy Max has done his word fine. So oh, awesome. So that. Uh, this is lockdown. Um, <laughs> right. So, and do you think you can do the 15s program and the sevens at the same time? Yep. Yep. So already setting up a plan of Corey, the sevens coach, um, playing super for some of the start of the year, going back to sevens for World Seven Series, Com Games, Sevens World Cup, and then, well, hoping I play good enough in the Super Rugby to make Blackburns at the end of the year. That's the goal. I don't know so, where I'm going to get home, time at home, but all good. <laughs> well, you're going to soak it up right now because you've got a big year ahead of you. Deserve a, a rested summer. I'm sure you won't be sitting around twiddling your thumbs for too much longer. Gossip, it's not in your nature. But it's been a real privilege to hear um, to hear about Tokyo, to hear about how you've honoured your mum's legacy, your Fano, um, and just the amazing culture that the Black Ferns have created. I mean, anyone in New Zealand just wants to be part of it, to be honest. And um, I, it has been so awesome. To, to have these um to have this chat with you so thank you so oh, much thanks Liz. i appreciate it it's nice talking about it i love it go well